Welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Arturo Vera, and I'm going to be the chairman of this session. Thank you for being here in this um, session. And uh, we have uh, in this session three presentations. Uh, the topics of this session is, uh, are about physiological signal processing. And we have uh, three presentations, uh, as I said. And we have 20 minutes for the whole presentation. So you have 15 minutes to make your pre presentation. And then we have five minutes to questions, comments, and answers. OK, so let's start with the first presentation. That is uh, char characterization of physiological signals under cogn cognitive stress, cognitive stress. So this work is presented by Jennifer Juana Limas uh -huh, from the Instituto Politecnico Nacional. So please. Thank you. Well, as the, uh, the chairman already presented me, uh, my following presentation consists in the characterizations of physiological signals under coming to stress. And that is shown on the screen. It's self-explanatory. I will give you a brief introduction, details about the protocol recording, show you our results as well as, well as our conclusions. Well, stress is a natural response of the organism uh, to challenging situations that threaten our safety, emotional stability, or well-being. There are several approaches that explain its origin. One of them is cognitive stress. Cognitive stress is a psychophysiological phenomenon that can manifest due to different causes, such as cognitive overload, time pressure, or multitasking. Consequently, this can lead to have fatigue, irritability, um, Sleep deprivation, muscle aches, and impaired concentration. This alteration also affects the way of learning on students. Uh, students who present high levels of cognitive stress face difficulties in their school performance and in their concentration. According to the American Psychological Association, academic stress is a contributing factor to school dropout. Um, reason why we look for ways to identify a situation that provokes stress. Estimation of cognitive stress through physiological measurement devices provides an accurate methodology for assessing stress related to cognitive processes such as electroencephalography, electrocardiography, or electromyography. Mm -hmm. A wide range of, range of studies have tried to establish a relationship between various stressful situations and the response of human, humans by using different types of physiological measures. Also, the importance of conducting appropriate statistic analysis between changes in physiological signals plays a critical role into the study of in cognitive stress. However, no study has estimated cognitive stress with the fusion of wearable sensors such as the E4 grid band and an EEG system, as well as the use of an appropriate matrix for each one of these like, signals. Sorry. Okay. So the process that we applied to our protocol recording consists in the um, stimulus application as well, well, with 14 volunteers with an E4 wristband and an EEG system. By that, we extract their signals recording, and at the final, we apply a statistic analysis. Okay, only here I'm gonna. Uh, detail some of the features of this wearable sensor that we use. First, we have the wristband E4 Empatica. This one have, has three sensors, the photoplethysmography, 
a galvanic skin response center and a accelerometer center. And this trick gives us blood volume pulse, heart rate, electrodermal activity, and skin temperature signals. And our EEG system consists of, e we use the 1020 international office. Now in our stimulus application, we apply a math test, which consists on three stages. The first one has, has a cut a duration of 15 minutes, and it consists to solve a math test with a low level of difficulty. By that, the second stage consists on a three minute relaxation where our volunteers rest with their eyes closed. And the final stage, as the same as the first one, it consists of 15 minutes and they resolve another math test, but in this case, with a high level of difficulty. Now, in our signal recording, there is, well, in each signal that we extract, it has a single frequency for each one of them. And in the EEG signal, we extract or calculate, sorry, the attention coefficient. This only to uh, show the concentration level of our volunteers in different stage and stress, stress stages. In the statistical analysis, we apply a raw and normalized segmentation of the extracted data, and we made a metric comparison with an ANOVA test of each one of the stages of each signal. And the following metric that we used was central tendency metrics, dispersion metrics, distribution metrics, core parameters, and trajectory parameters. Are shown on the following table. As you can see here, we use symbols to identify or to indicate significant differences between the respective stages. First, we have our signals that they were the following ones. And as we can see, the signals that have significant differences between uh, them is heart rate, temperature, and EEG. And the metrics that help us to identify these changes were range and pulsatility. And as we can see here, and it is important to note it, is that heart rate and by grouping heart rate and temperature, we can see the difference, differences between, between the three stages. And by grouping temperature and EEG, by that means the attention coefficient, we can see differences between the three stages. These three stages or the following symbols can be, uh, we can see the stages, the differences yeah. below the trees. Oh. In the following graph, yeah, we have our significant signals. First, we have in this tree, in the stage one, we can see an increase of our volunteers in their time mode, specifically in heart rate and temperature. The attention coefficient is maintained uh, and in the three stages, a same level, a similar level in each one of them. This means that they maintain a similar level of concentration in, in each of the stages. But in this case, in heart rate, we can see on stage, stage two, that was the relaxation stage. It was a decrease on their signals in heart rate and temperature. And the final stage, we can see here that there is an increase, but not so much as the first stage in both of them. And in the case of, that they maintain a similar behavior in their signals, or they maintain their relaxation and concentration. And we add the agency signal just to prove that there weren't sudden movement, but that I mean that they were applying their test in a form, a correct form. 
Now we have the cluster visualization for further analysis. Uh, here, as I mentioned before, by grouping heart rate and temperature, we can visualize the three stages in a better way, as the same as the EEG signal and temperature signal. But on the other hand, if we group heart rate and EEG signal, the attention coefficient is not as visible as the other graphs right here. And that we conclude that the most appropriate variables, as I mentioned before, is range and kurtosis. But as we saw, we only use range just because we see we saw a difference with, in a p-value less than 0.25 in all stages. That, that's the values that we obtained in the analysis. And most of the volunteers in stage three maintain a response similar to the relaxation stage or less. And by combining the response E4 and EEG, was possible to verify and identify community stress. And for me, that's all. If you have any further questions, you can contact me via email or you can scan the code to see more of our work in the laboratory. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. And I don't know if we have a question for Carol. Yes. Can you go back to the class and where you show the significant difference? The table? Ah, yeah. This one? Okay. Thank you. Well, do you think there is a, a reason that we don't have a a significant difference in hair rate uh, about me. Uh, because I compare it with the following uh, graph. Uh -huh. The other map? Yes. Yeah. This uh, this is for what? What what is the 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 eight poles, the horizontal line in middle of the squares is the mean? Yeah. Yeah. What uh, I suppose but we I can see a different, a significant difference. Ah, uh, well, these um, results are the normalized data, uh -huh. and by that we only use the range metric to show um, the behavior of each signal. Sorry, if I didn't mention that. Uh, you mentioned a attention coefficient for the electroencephalography. How do you obtain that measure? Okay. Here we uh, made only a difference between alpha and beta, if I remember. A ratio. A ratio of alpha and beta. Okay. Well, I have a, a question and a comment. I think that stress is very important because it is related with many diseases. So why, why are you trying to, to study cognitive stress, cognitive stress? What is the purpose of your study? The final purpose, let's say, the final purpose of your study. Uh, just to have a better visualization of the reason of why students drop out of school mm -hmm. or there is a, an amount of people that drop out of school in, by uh, the first semester or in the middle of the school. Okay. And yeah, for me, it's, it's like something that I want to continue studying mm -hmm. with um, further Study. Are there other research groups that are working on that uh, topic? Uh, specifically, right now, I don't know one, but I know that there is a branch of studies right now that mm -hmm. not only with measure uh, physiological devices, also like questions like uh, psychological 
form or test, test to apply to students and know the differences between the first years of school and at the end. And that is why I'm doing that right now for my social services. And I want to look if uh, all if the <laughs> thing well my social services turns right, I will uh, show up. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll continue with the next presentation that is uh, physiological changes associated to the use of N N95 uh, mask that will be presented by Jerisa Gomez Martinez from the Instituto Politecnico Nacional. So if you can share your screen, Jerisa, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay. If you can share your presentation with us, please. Yes, I'm um, going. So remember, we have 15 minutes and then five yes. minutes to for questions and comments. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, but the page is not letting me present the, my page. You know how to do it? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, but okay. I think it's ready. Okay. 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 We can see your your presentation. If there is any problem, okay. you can let me know, please. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jerita Gomez Martinez, and in collaboration with PhD Diana Gómez Hernández, uh, Black Atuar Corona and Laura Ivonne Gray Jimenez, we developed the project entitled Physiological Changes Associated to the Use of a 95 Mask. Uh, in this slide, you can watch the content of this presentation. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the use of N95 mask uh, has become a daily practice among the general population and health personnel as one of the measures presented by the World Health Organization to prevent the transmission of respiratory disease. Moreover, the use is also recommended in cities with high concentration of pollutants when particles content represents ever damage to the health of their inhabitants in short, medium, and long term. According to some qualitative studies, um, the use of this protective barrier uh, generates a perception of increased respiratory effort, shortness of breath, headache, dizziness, and even difficulty in communicating. Uh, these symptoms uh, causes that the use is considered as an indicator of a state of health. For this reason, uh, this protocol was implemented to identify whether this perception corresponds to physiological changes in oxygen saturation and heavy variability. Uh, at first part, we will see that heavy rate is the number of contraction of the heart for time unit. It is expressed in beats per minute or BPM, and typical, typical values range from 60 to 100 BPM. On the other hand, as we can see in the image when, right here, a heavy variability is the variation of the time elapses between the electrocardiograms or, or intervals that are also called inner beat interval or IB. In the part of photoplethysmography, uh, we know that this is um, a low cost optical technique that can be used to detect changes in blood volume through changes in light observation. In this case, we can watch here in the image that we have a systolic phase and a diastolic phase. Uh, in this case, the peak-to-peak -peak interval the, of these two systolic, that are these parts, these ones, uh, can show you or uh, strongly correlated to the RR interval 
of the ECG. And it can be, or both are used to represent the cardiac cycle. cycle. Uh, so in this way, it allows to derive physiological parameters as uh, blood oxygenation and respiratory rate. In the part of oxygen saturation, uh, we can measure with pulse oximetry and we can estimate it from photoplethysmography. This is a non-invasive medium and it's, it uses optical sensor to, to analyze how is the pulse in the middle or the index finger. And the normal values go to 95 to 100%. Uh, these sensors are composed of an matter of different wavelengths of light and light receiver. In them, the absorption of the light and the hemoglobin changes with the degree of oxygenation saturation. In this study, we use the PPG signal to estimate um, the signal. Related to the methodology, the MAX86150 evaluation system was used to record the physiological signals. In this case, uh, we have a general methodology where we divide it into six parts. And the first part was um, some proofs in the system where we can identify which will be the conditions of record. Then the report were taken. In another stage, the results of the health questionnaires were analyzed to know which records were viable to process because some of them have some, are, um, some noise in them. Then the algorithms were applied to filter them, filter the signals and processing to estimate the oxygen saturation and the calculation of the RR intervals to continue with the statistical analysis and obtain the results. During the testing of the system, it was established that the, the subject should be seated, how we can watch here in the image with both hands in a plain surface, on a flat surface. So it was comfortable for them to place their hands as uh, shown here in the image. That is the system that we use. Um, regarding to the characteristics of the test subjects, uh, the, recordings, the recordings were taken in 20 subjects, which uh, 11 of them were women and nine of them was men, where with an age of 18 to 52 years old. For the study, certain conditions were established under which the recording will not be able for analysis. Such conditions are the shown here, and these are that the subject presented a regular consumption of alcohol or tobacco, anemia, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, COVID-19, uh, even if they was in a pharmacologic treatment or, or if they have less than five hours of sleep. Uh, after this, uh, after applying this exclusion criteria, we are only able to analyze a record of seven subjects. Relating to the recording protocol, uh, we have these four main stages. Uh, in the reception part, uh, the subject was received and proceeded to wash her hands and apply antibacterial gel. In the parts of in the part of the of presentation, the person in change of the study introduced himself and explaining to the subjects the faces that we will be recording and resolved any doubts. And after this, we gave him an informed consent from with the previous information in order that they could understand everything and signature. In the clinical information recollection, we apply some questionnaires to identify the health status and the habits of the subject. And in the preparation, uh, we recollect the, the identification data of the volunteers. Uh, after all this, we have the, re the re registration without mask. Uh, the first stage consists in that uh, the person uh, take rest for 10 minutes uh, in totally rest, after which uh, the fingers were cleaning. Uh, we take the recording signals in the middle and the index finger continued to, for two and a half minutes. That's the, the long of the recording. 
In the physical exercise phase, um, we, the subject was asked to perform 10 minutes of high knees. Okay, that is this exercise of right here. Uh, after which the subject fingertips were clean and the measure was taken for two and a half minutes. In the third one, uh, the subject was asked to sit down again and rest for another 10 minutes. And then the fingers were clean and we take the recording again. Um, after all this, we gave him, um, well, to the subject, we gave him a new and sealed mask uh, in which it should be placed and explain how they should wear it. And uh, we continue with the next measurements. In this case, we repeat the same uh, measurements, but in this case with mask and uh, totally uh, taking care of maintaining the conditions and the time. Finally, in the perception questionnaire, the subjects were able to show us or to let us know if they present any kind of discomfort or physical symptom. In the part of signal processing, we apply a third order of other word passband with a cutoff frequencies from 0.8 Hertz to 4 Hertz only for the PPG signal. Uh, the HR parameters in the error wave detection were extracted from PPG signal using the threshold method to obtain the EV from the signals. Uh, after that, we processed all this information using MATLAB 2020B and exported the results uh, to GraphPath Prism uh, version 9 for the statistical analysis. Uh, we apply some normality tests to identify if it was possible to apply ordinary one-way ANOVA and then a nested one-way ANOVA. The stages comparison was made in uh, with alpha equal to 0.1. As a result, uh, we can find first that the procession questionnaire is shown us that the physical exercise without mask, 14% of the of the subjects present dizziness, another 14% uh, present low intensity headaches, and 28% uh, have sensation of suffocation or of asphyxia. In the case of the rest without max, only 14% present dizziness. And finally, in the physical exercise with mask, we found that 14% have asphyxia or sensation of and the other 14% uh, have a low intensity headache. This data is similar to another uh, studies, qualitative studies, like we will see in the references, that is the relevant one. Uh, related to the EV behavior, we can watch here in the violin plots, the distribution of the data. In the graphs, we find first the both uh, the both um, stages of rest, then the part of physical exercise, and then, and then the recovery stage. Uh, after realizing a, a statistical analysis, we found that there are no significant differences between the stages with and without mask. Related to the uh, oxygen saturation, uh, we will find something similar. He will he will have first the, the rest stage, physical exercise, and recovery. Uh, in this case, we found also that there wasn't significant differences, but uh, in this particular case, we found that there was significant difference uh, between the, part, the stage of rest without mask and the physical exercise without mask. Uh, this could be normal for the metabolism um, patterns, patterns, but uh, this information differs from what we found in the case when the subject was wearing mask. Uh, so for conclusion, we have three main points. The first one is that the EV value shown that despite of 10 minutes of rest, after the physical exercise, the subject had not yet returned to baseline values, as we can see in the, as we see before in the plots. 
Uh, also, no significant changes in EV or oxygen saturation were identified between the periods with and without the mask, um, with the exception that I mentioned before. And the difference between the data and the subject perception, perception is attributed to the psychological factor. And this because some of them are uh, actually mentioned that they have some problems in communication. Here are the references that we use for this presentation. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have questions? For Yanisa? Yanisa. OK. Do you think there is a, another variable which can affect, for example, I'm thinking about uh, temperature, to this sensation of uh, asphyxia, 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 asphyxia? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we think that, yeah, that this could be such a useful signal. But in in the moment that we make these these recordings, we have some problems with some sensors. So at the end, we we ended only working with these two signals that were estimated from PPG. But yes, of course, it will be so useful to understand maybe why they have these differences between the perception questionnaire and uh, and the data obtained. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Another question? Uh, in your exclusion criteria? Yeah. You do not consider people who sleep less than five hours? No. How does the hours of sleep affect your, your signals? Mm, okay. Uh, we at the beginning of the study, we was trying to understand too if there's any changes in the pressure, in the volume of the pressure. So we was thinking about it and we researched it and we found, uh, in this moment, I don't have the names of the studies, but we find that uh, this could be some affections related to the uh, hair rate uh, values and also to the, um, um, I, I don't know how to say it, uh, about the conductivity of the signals. So we try to um, avoid these recordings and have more, more clear or viable signals to analyze. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Why are you being about the athletic wearing mask to to um, sorry for the interruption. Can you repeat it again? I can hear you well. I think they have to come closer. To ah, because we have that one. Can you come closer, please? <laughs> come closer, please. <laughs> Why do you mean about the uh, athletic wear mask to improve their performance? Uh, well. So sorry, I don't know if it's a problem with my Wi-Fi connection, but I can hear you well. Did, did you hear the question? No, did you hear? I can no. understand the he, words. He now, asking, yeah, I can hear you. If, if you think, uh, he says that the, that the, uh, how did you say athletes? Athletes. athletes? athletes can use masks to improve her, uh, their perf performance. So do you think that it is uh, uh, useful to use masks when athletes to, to improve the, their performance? Uh, I know. Okay. I, I know it actually, <laughs> yeah, I think you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, actually, where, when I was um, making the art state, I found that there's another studies where some people only use athlete and they actually mentioned that these don't have uh, any changes in their, in their performance, um, more than the, the psychological sensation. Mm, but physiologically, they was acting the same. 
So I have a comment. As far as I understood, uh, you are comparing the physiological signals, the parameters, the physiological parameters with the perception of people. So it's the same conclusion, conclusion for the athletes. You don't, uh, you have the sensation, the perception that uh, it causes some, uh, uh, how do you say, that you're not co com comfortable with that, mm -hmm. but, uh, but physiological, physiologically, there are no changes in the, in the, in people. Is that right? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Because the even only qualitative studies found is that most of the person was shown shown uh, they they have discomfort or physical yeah. symptoms, but physiologically, the in many many studies right now, uh, there was found that even changing the the altitude of the places, uh, this doesn't have any change. Because I have another question. Because if you have that perception, uh, it is it could be a stressing. We were talking about stress, but when you use masks, uh, it's a stressing. Or at least for me, it's a stress. It, it yeah. causes me uh, a lot of stress. So I didn't ask you, but I think that heart uh, heart rate variability is related with stress, and you measure heart rate variability. You didn't find any difference in in that case with uh, uh, when using mask and without using mask? Uh, actually, not if I am come back to the slide, but even if the distribution of the data is different in both of the plots, uh, when we was doing the, the signal processing, we found that the numbers was uh, yes, difference, of course, it was uh, some difference between the data, but talking in the statistical analysis, this wasn't significant. So maybe the distribution is different, but they are almost in the same scale in both of the plots. Okay. Okay. Do you have any more questions? More questions? No? Maybe online. Maybe online. Is there any question online? Thank you very much. We have our last presentation that is mechanical activity associated with gastric gastric pacemaker that is presented by Karina Espinosa Espeje also from the Instituto Politécnico Nacional. So, Karina, oh, can you hear me? No, Nancy, 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 Nancy will be doing it. Yes, uh, I'm here. Speaker, yes. Can you share your screen with us, please? Yes, uh, just a moment. You can see her. You see the presentation. Yes, we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present to you the work titled "Mechanical Activity Associated with Gastric Pacemaker," uh, which was carried out by Karina Espinosa Espejel, uh, Laura Garay Jiménez, Blanca Tobar Corona, and I, uh, Nancy Martínez Hernández. Uh, so this presentation is structured into four main sections. Uh, we will begin with an introduction uh, to cover uh, the fundamental concept, uh, followed by a methodology section uh, showcasing the algorithms uh, employed. And later, uh, we will delve into the results. And finally, we will draw our conclusions. So for the introduction, uh, as we know, uh, stomach uh, movements or gastric contraction uh, is a mechanical response to the electrical stimulus in the muscle cells of the stomach wall. Uh, this electrical stimuli creates slow electrical uh, waves. Um, uh, this electrical stimulus uh, was produced here in the upper part of the body of the stomach 
and move uh, downward uh, through the antrum of the pillar of, as we can see here with this arrow, uh, the direction. Also, we call this the gastric pacemaker uh, that has a basic rhythm of three cycles uh, per minute. Uh, where these electrical stimulus cause the stomach uh, to contract uh, depends on what's, in, uh, what's inside of the stomach. I mean, uh, the internal conditions are uh, defined by the food pullers. Uh, mechanical activity uh, has been associated with the present of higher frequency signals uh, used after the peacemaker. Uh, so, the uh, electrical activity can be measured uh, by electrodes placed uh, on the surface of the ab abdomen, as we can see here in this image. And this technique uh, is now a surface electrogastrography and has been used to analyze gastric disorders uh, through the recording of myoelectric uh, signals. Uh, there are some studies, uh, such as Garibald, that we see here in this image, uh, where he makes a proposal for recording uh, with a network of 24 electrodes uh, that analyze uh, their correlation with uh, stomach uh, motility. Uh, for the methodology section. Uh, first, uh, we obtained the electrogastography signals uh, from a database uh, that include uh, 58 uh, healthy volunteers, uh, now as the control group, and also 23 uh, subjects uh, from the, pa the patient group, uh, who are people with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, um, these records uh, were acquired uh, through three states, uh, fasting and water with uh, 15 minutes uh, of duration each. And, and, uh, and another state uh, now as nourishment with 30 minutes uh, of duration. But uh, this one has been divided into two states, uh, nourishment one and nourishment two with 15 minutes uh, duration each. And so these words involved uh, fasting, water, uh, nourish one and uh, nourish two uh, are important uh, because that's the name that we use uh, to refer to the states uh, in the results section. So all these, all of these recordings uh, were made through six electrodes uh, positioned as shown in the figure uh, here uh, below. And where the blue grid uh, shows the position of the electrodes that were used in the Garibaldi study, uh, the image I showed in the previous slide. So, to analyze uh, the data, uh, we follow, follow it, uh, this is the, the steps outlined here in the figure. And we begin applying a discrete wavelet transfer uh, using the DB4 uh, model wavelet. In order to extract the peacemaker and the bands associated with the mechanical activity. So, the, uh, this uh, peacemaker signal uh, was reconstructed uh, using the corresponded, uh, corresponding approximation uh, coefficients uh, from levels uh, 8 to 12. So, we selected uh, these levels uh, because they contain the frequency range that characterize the peacemaker rhythm. And on the other hand, uh, the mechanical activity uh, was extracted uh, using details levels 4 to 7. And, can, and later we calculate uh, the energy at each of these wavelet uh, decomposition levels, uh, as we uh, can see here in this image. And then uh, with these energy levels, uh, we filter it uh, using a four-order boiler board. A low pass filter with a cutoff of a frequency of one hertz. And this allows us uh, to identify the peaks in both uh, the peacemaker and mechanical activity signals. So, here in the figure, we can depict the filter at energy levels uh, that are uh, shown here in blue, and their envelope is indicated in black. And so, uh, after that, uh, we marked the peaks in the envelope of mechanical activity levels with uh, red vertical lines, and each of these uh, lines corresponding to one of the peaks in the associated association signal, which is here represented in green. In green. And so, we then associated uh, this peak, uh, the 
Peacemaker and Mechanical uh, Activity with the association signal and calculate uh, the percentage of association uh, per group and stage. So, uh, moving on to the results. Uh, here uh, in this figure, uh, shows the percentage of association between the control group uh, market uh, here with the star and the patient group uh, market with triangles. And by states, uh, fasting, water, nourish one and uh, nourish two. And, and by channels, we uh, consider the position of the electro that I showed early, but we can see here in the inferior corner the, where we put these electrodes the, from channels one to six. So this percentage of association uh, was calculated uh, with the number of signs a uh, mechanical activity occurred uh, when there was a peacemaker. As you can see, uh, the six channels they have different view of the abdom uh, abdominal area. Uh, that is the behavior of the stomach. Uh, for example, in the upper part of the stomach, it uh, shows very little uh, gastric uh, activity. And we can corroborate uh, this with the results uh, of channel one, uh, because in which the lowest values are seen with in respect to the other channels. And these results uh, are what we expected uh, since at the top of the mechanical activity is lower and spreads uh, preferably uh, downward. So, uh, next, mm, in this graph, uh, it is showed uh, the percentage of association uh, within groups uh, by states. And there is a clear difference uh, between what group? the control and patient group, uh, since the patient group uh, has uh, a slightly higher average uh, percentage of association uh, compared uh, to the control group. Uh, however, uh, the standard deviation of the control group is higher uh, because the stomach is adapting to the conditions. And the fact that the variability is lower implies that you are not responding as efficiently as you would like to the different conditions. And this is happening in the patient's group. So, uh, as we see, uh, there are notable uh, differences uh, between both groups and both figures. So, it is easy to identify which values uh, belong to each group. Uh, so, as conclusion, uh, Gary Van Serol uh, used uh, 24 electrodes, uh, like in the image I showed uh, a few slides, uh, slides earlier. Even though our study was limited to only six electrodes, uh, the area covered in the abdominal area was similar uh, to his study. Uh, in addition, uh, the peacemaker uh, was presented at the signal. And this tells us that the number of electrodes can vary, but you, you uh, have to make sure they cover the area of interest. Uh, furthermore, uh, the proposed methodology and metrics uh, allow us to observe difference uh, in the conditions uh, of the two groups uh, for each stage, and depending on the area where it is uh, recorded. So, a uh, comparison with one uh, sample DT and show that channel two is capable uh, to identify the group uh, along all the stages, the fasting, water, and nourishment one and two. Um, on the other hand, uh, our work uh, showed similar results uh, with other studies. Since the difference was observed within both groups, also uh, the values vary depending on the location of the electrode. But they remain between 30 and 40 throughout the, uh, the process. And here are some references that I use for this presentation. And thanks for your attention. If you have any further interest, uh, please contact the laboratory team and through these uh, emails, uh, the website, or scanning this QR. And thank you. Hey, how do uh, how do you define the control group? Can you hear? Me? Uh, yes. 
Este... ¿Ve control grip? ¿Here? Okay, here, anything. Awesome. I'm asking for a graph that you show uh, patterns and control. Uh, for this one? It's the same. Is the healthy uh, participant? Mm -hmm. I think here. Again. Can you repeat the question? How did you find how do you define the control group? He's asking if the healthy volunteers are the control group. Is is uh, the yes. same? Yes, it's the same. The healthy volunteer is the control group. Yes. I was I have a question about your database. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you take that um, recordings of the from the stomach, or do you have a public database? Do you take a public database, or where did you get the the data that you use in your in your um, story? The, another person uh, who belongs to the laboratory uh, make a previous study, but she she records this data this database, so we use it uh, for this analysis. Ah, okay. that affects the way that we extract the energy or nutrients uh, from the food. So this, all of this process uh, occurs in the stomach. So if you have diabetes, uh, all of this process is affected. So when you eat something, uh, the mechanical activity uh, uh, can be different from a healthy person. Ah, OK, so you found that differences in that graph you can uh, see the, the difference between healthy people and uh, people with diabetes. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other um, diseases that are that change uh, mechanic, mechanical activity of the stomach? Mm -hmm. Or only diabetes uh, changes the mechanical activity? Or why did you decide to study diabetes? Because we know that diabetes changes the, the motility. The, the Yes. Uh, the absorption of the nutrients from okay. the food. So that was the main purpose. Uh, main purpose. Uh, okay. Do you have any questions? No. Yes. So uh, the all the fatty and groups have uh, pacemakers. Pacemakers. Okay. Yes. Yes, but they say uh, differ on the signal. Uh, or oh, the, the energy levels between uh, healthy and uh, patients. Uh, as a comment, uh, why don't you use uh, control with a uh, uh, patients with pacemaker, but we are, uh, for example, diabetes and with diabetes? And if you are with pacemaker, pacemaker means the that's not basic. Oh, the fish. Not the fish. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I'm curious. The question: Is it possible that the 
Yeah, affective state can change the signal. I was thinking about, for example, the common phrase to uh, I have butterflies in my stomach, <laughs> something like that. Can you repeat it again, please? The, the affective state can change the EGG response. In other words, when you're in love, does <laughs> it change the mechanical mechanical activity of the stomach? Or maybe more general, not the emotion. The emotion, the emotion changes the mechanical mechanical activity of the stomach. <laughs> what I do think, you think about? I think yes, it can change. Uh, but here in this study, we we don't. Consider right uh, that option. Thank you. So, Professor uh, Tovar uh, told me that you are working with uh, in a hospital with a physician. She was a ah, she was me. Ah, okay. Who made the but she did all the signal process. Uh -huh. uh, but did, did you show the results to the physician? What we, what we, uh, we haven't uh, gone back to the uh, yet. Because it, it could be very interesting for, for, for them or for them to, to, to see the results. Of course. Okay. Another question? Do you have another question? No? No, no more questions. So this was the last presentation. Thank you very much for being here. In behalf of the organizer committee of the CCP, uh, I would like to thank you for, for your presentations and for being here. So, any, any announcement? For the... uh, so at four o'clock, we start with the plenary session. Uh -huh. yeah, and it's related to biomedical yes, research. It is related so to what intelligence in health. So if you want to be involved in that session, it's a plenary session, I think.